A lot of people think there's going to be this magical day um, where they've got no job, no kids, no responsibilities, <laughs> uh, no business, and that's when they're going to write their book. And that's just never going to happen. Like you're going to have to get started before you're ready. There's never a good time to write a book. I view it as a short-term sacrifice and a short-term investment to build a long-term asset. <music> Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces. I also bring you ideas and techniques that you can grab and use to set goals, create, and unlock your potential for changing yourself and the world. And now let's get to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. You're gonna love this guest, I'm just telling you now. Check out Chandler Bolt. Chandler Bolt is an investor, the CEO of Self Publishing School and selfpublishing.com. He's Forbes 30 Under 30 and the author of seven best-selling books, including his most recent book that's titled Published. Obviously, you know what we're going to be talking about. Self-Publishing School is an Inc. 5000 company for the last three years in a row as one of the 5,000 fastest growing private companies in the USA. Chandler is also the host of the Seven Figure Principles podcast and the Self-Publishing School podcast. Through his books, podcasts, YouTube channels, and Self-Publishing Schools, he has helped thousands of people write a book that grows their income, impact business. And quite frankly, if you're in the fiction realm, this might be very interesting to you too, because self-publishing nowadays is queen. Chandler, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Yes, ma'am. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to have you here in part because I am an author myself. So I am thrilled to talk to you about the help that you're giving so many people who have their story to tell, whether it's for their business or maybe even just to have their story out in the world. I would love it if you talk a little bit about what brought you from where you were to where you are. How did you get to this place where, mm -hmm. you know what I want to do? I want to help people self-publish their books. Yeah, uh, I think books were a big part of it. I mean, ironically enough, you know, I'm a C-level English student and a college dropout with ADHD. Mm. I'm so kind of the last person you ever think to write a book um, or to write books. I mean, I dropped out of school and, and, and because I was tired of learning how to run a business from professors who have never ran businesses. Ah. Kind of mm -hmm. What I've always wanted to do is run businesses. Um, but, I, you know, I, I didn't particularly love reading or writing. Mm. I would. And so I just kind of avoided it. But then when I dropped out of school, I said, well, I need to keep learning as if I'm in school but just change the mechanism and how I'm learning. And so I really turned to books and I wrote and published my first couple of books and then also kind of simultaneously started reading like crazy and it just opened up this whole world. And so I think in that, I discovered that books change lives. <laughs> like yeah, books change the lives of readers. I mean, I think that's kind of obvious and so many people listening to this are, can probably name at least one book that's changed their life, but then also books started changing my life as an author. And so did it a couple of times. People started asking about it and then finally said, maybe I should start teaching this because just so many people were asking. And then we started teaching it at self-publishing school and then, or we started teaching it and, in, in what ultimately became self-publishing school. And, um, and then fast forward today, and we've published about 6,000 books wow. over the last seven years, so about two to three books a day. Unbelievable. That's amazing. That congratulations on the success. And also, <laughs> no, seriously, because because this is one of those things there are a lot of people out there who are afraid, right there. They might have yeah. a story to tell. They might have something that would be really helpful to people, but they are afraid to publish their books in part because there are so many, but also because to make a book successful, like you invest your money, you invest your time, you invest your soul, maybe <laughs> make a yeah. deal with the devil, whatever, you know, to, to write this book, and then you might sell 50 copies. So I'd love to find out from you who, you know, you've published over 6,000 books, who should be writing books? What are the reasons someone might write a book? And what is your advice for people who want to get started? Yeah, um, I, I think who should be writing books? I mean, I think people who want to grow their impact, mm -hmm. their income or their business. Those are kind of the three groups of people. So we've got probably people, you know, people who want to grow their business using a book. That's a big amount of people that come to us. A big group of people that come to work with us are uh, people who say, hey, I've got this book that I've got to write. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> and either it's going to be a part of my legacy or it's going to be a part of the impact that I want to make. And they, and they do that. And it's sometimes that's fiction. It's like, Hey, I've got this story that is just burning a hole in my brain and I got to mm-hmm. share it. Um, and, and then, it, so I think those are probably the, the two or three buckets of people who come to us for help on their books. And then who should write a book? I mean, I, had a, I, I used to get asked this question all the time and I guess still do somewhat, but it should everyone write a book. And I used to say no. <laughs> and, 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 you know, there's just some people that just should not write a book. But then I, I really had a, a friend challenge me on that. And he said, do you ever wish that you could read the book of your, your grandfather um, or your, your, you know, your, your grandpa, your grandma, whoever? And the answer was yes. Cause I had a grandpa that passed away when I was one year mm. old and by all accounts, he was a legend. Wow. <laughs> Uh, but I never, I will never know what his life was like, the lessons that he learned, all those things. So that com- coming down to that, I think for most, even if it's just for that reason of just for my kids and grandkids, uh, I think everyone has a story to share and lessons that they can share. And sure, it might not be a New York Times bestseller, um, but it can be meaningful, it, it, at least to you and a small group of people around you. And so I think that's who should write it. And then I think the bigger question that you ask is, is how do you do it? Or how I think is maybe is how do you, how do you get started? Mm-hmm. And for, for me, I think anyone listening to this, if you got a topic that you think you want to write about, as soon as you get done listening to this podcast interview, grab a blank sheet of paper. Um, and uh, so the, I teach this process is called the more writing method, more is an acronym. Mm-hmm. And the M stands for mind map, right? And so I would take 15 minutes, mind map out everything that you can think of on that topic. So stories that you have, lessons that you've learned, everything you can think of, right? And then, and then in, in doing that, I think you're going to discover that you've got a whole lot more that you can write about than you think. And that's going to help you get started on the journey um, to writing your book and, and make the writing process a whole lot easier. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny when I when I do that, I give myself uh, five minutes and I go 30, 30. Mm-hmm. I want to come up with 30 whatevers, 30 headlines, 30 topics, 30 ideas and just really push myself. And yet, frankly, I have so many ideas that I, I will never write all of them, right? I will never write all the books. So yeah. how do you, as someone who's, who's you know, teaching people how to do this, how do you teach people to hone in on their message or hone in on their story? Because sometimes we meander. I know I do. You know, my, and my, mm. my husband and I call it shiny pretty thing syndrome. He's got ADHD yeah. and, and he's easily distracted away from whatever it was he was trying to do. And the same thing can happen in stories, whether it's a nonfiction tale or a fictional one. You can, you can run away from your point pretty far and then yeah. not get back to it. And then you sort of look at this project and go, well, what was I trying to do? What is your, yeah. what is your guidance for someone who needs that sort of structure? Yeah, I, I recommend, um, I think this is where it dovetails back because I can relate to that because that's mm. me, right? I, I've, I have and continue to struggle with a lot of the things that you just mentioned. And, and so I think that's where it dovetails back with that more writing mm-hmm. method. And so the, it's an acronym. I talk about it in my new book. Um, and so the M is mind map, as we already covered. But then the O stands for outline. Mm. Uh, and so using that mind map to inform an outline. And I think sometimes for, for people like you or your husband or myself, that can, that can sound constricting. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, that sucks. And I create this outline. This is rigid. Where's the creativity in that? But really, it, it, it introduces freedom. And, and so because you have kind of some guardrails, you can then be expressive and know that you're, you're not losing the plot of the book. And so the mind map, then turn that mind map into an outline. The R stands for rough draft. Mm-hmm. The E stands for editing, right? So mind map, outline, rough draft, editing. Uh, and an important piece there is as you're writing your rough draft, go one chapter at a time and mind map, outline, then write that chapter, right? And repeat that process chapter by chapter by chapter. And I think that's how uh, you, you, can, you stay on track on a per chapter basis and within the overarching outline for the book as a whole, uh, while still making consistent progress and feeling good about the process and not feeling like you're restricted to this outline. Because that's the big thing is an outline is very helpful but it's also, it's, it's also fluid. <laughs> and so I think sometimes people, you know, the, the people will create, especially type A personalities will create this outline. It's like, Oh, 
Now I got to stick to the right. outline, can't change it. And so, so then of course they feel intimidated by creating this outline, right? Because they think it's going to be this immovable thing that they'll never be able to change. So either they don't create the outline or they spend so long creating the outline that, it, that they don't actually start writing the book. And so that's why I just encourage that kind of iterative process. Mm -hmm. And then great news, you'll get, you'll get the rough draft finished if you follow that process. And then that's where the editing comes in to make it a much better book. I love it. I love it. You're going to hear you're going to hear silence on my end periodically, Chandler. I just want to tell you that. And that's because I sort of want to take in what you've said and process it and synthesize it before I before I come up with my next question. And I love the notion that you that you said, you know, that it that it's guardrails. And I talk about guardrails with my clients, mm -hmm. too, that, you know, guardrails, like when you're going bowling and you're a kid, they put those little rails up that no matter where you throw the ball, generally speaking, it's going in the right direction. So it's sort of a it's sort of a constraint, if you will, that you can work within. And yet when you're doing it, when you're sitting down to write, like you said, you might go, oh, this is intimidating to me. But you still have to put your butt in your seat and you still have to get the writing down. So what what is your thought about the psychology of getting used to the fact that you're a writer? Right. You people want to write a book, but they think, oh, but I'm not a writer. What is your thought about that? Like get, put your butt in your seat and write 500 words is one thing. But how do we how do we get around or work through the intimidation and the and the lack of confidence about telling our story? Yeah, uh, I so my I was in scouts growing up and the boy mm -hmm. scouts and my scout master you know we were on this camping trip in the mountains i'm from south carolina and it's kind of the blue ridge mountains there and we were in the mountains on a camping trip and i remember asking i said hey are there bears in these woods i'd heard that there are bears <laughs> and and he said yep there are like that's that's why we hang up you know we that's why we hang up our food in the tree is so that the bears don't you know break into our stuff and and, and eat our food and all that stuff and said, so, well, hold up, what happens if we see a bear <laughs> while we're in the woods? And he, he kind of made a joke and gave me a wink and said, you know, if we run into a bear, here's the good news. You don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than your friend. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Yikes. and it's just like, well, hold up, what does this have to do with writing a book? Uh, and, and, and I think for a lot of people, when they go to write a book, there's this imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm that comes up, right? Which is who am I to write a book? Who's going to listen to me? Is this book going to be any good? Um, and the bad news is that that never really ever goes away. <laughs> um, but the, the good news is that you don't have to be faster than the bear or you don't have to know everything, right? You just have to know a little bit more than the person that you're teaching, right? So, sim so, so you don't have to know everything. You just have to know a little bit more than the person that you're teaching. And so that would be my encouragement for people who are maybe in that phase thinking about not starting mm -hmm. or, or, or afraid to start, right? And so that, that's the mindset piece. And then there's the discipline piece, which we already mentioned, which is you've got to get your, your mind map and outline done in your first thousand words on the page. And my goal is for, for people to get there as fast as possible after listening to this interview. Because once you get to that point, you're going to start to believe that this is possible. And then it's about bridging from your first thousand words to your rough draft done. And when you get your rough draft done, that's when, I mean, gosh, light bulbs just go on. You start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. You start to believe that this is possible. This is not just an idea. This is actually happening. Like there's all those things. And so that's the goal is to get to that, uh, that point sooner rather than later. Yeah. I, <laughs> I feel like I should be going mic drop after every time you finish speaking. Yeah, the, I, absolutely. And and the thing is, though, that I'm, you know, I work with a lot of a lot of clients who want to write stories, who want to have their say, who want to start a podcast, whatever it is. There, there is that barrier of entry that they feel like they can't. They're too busy. They've got, you know, I've got children. I've got this. I've got that. How do I find the time? How do I do it in a way not only to, that gets over that imposter syndrome that you're talking about, but also how do I eke out the time in my busy day if I'm a business owner or, or if I have or, or if writing is my side hustle, for example, 
How do yeah. I do that? How, what, what's your thought on, on, you know, what, what do we need to do? Like what I tell my clients is you don't have to write for an hour a day. You can write for five minutes a day, as long as you make it a habit. Right. But there might be a better yeah. way. So I'd love to know from you, what is, what is the method that you encourage your students and your clients to use to actually make time to write their story? Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a couple of things that I would mention. Um, one is, it, I think you're exactly right. A lot of people think there's going to be this magical day um, where they've got no job, no kids, no responsibilities, mm -hmm. uh, no business. And that's when they're going to write their book. And, and, and that's just never going to happen. Like you're going to have to get started before you're ready. There's never a good time to write a book. Um, you're going to have to start before you're ready. Uh, and I view it as a short-term sacrifice uh, in a short-term investment to build a long-term asset, right? You, you sacrifice that time, whether it's over the course of a year, two years, uh, whatever it is, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're doing that sacrifice and that book is going to go on to impact thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even millions of people. All these benefits are going to come from right, that, right? But it's gonna, it takes that short-term sacrifice. Now, once you commit to doing that, I think you need a, a strong why and a strong why now to even get started in the process. But then there's the practicality of, okay, how do you roll up your sleeves and actually get it mm -hmm. done? Um, so I, I, I say play to your strengths and how you know how you, how you write best. So are you someone who's, okay, you need to batch a weekend and say, I'm going to make as much progress as possible uh, in a short weekend. Or are you someone who, says, hey, I, I, I'm pretty disciplined and I can do 30 minutes a day or I can do a thousand words a day. Well, if you do a thousand words a day for 60 days straight, that's 60,000 words. That's, that's a, a nonfiction book. You can go even shorter than that on nonfiction books, but that's a, definitely a full length nonfiction book, right? So that's what I would recommend for folks. Follow the more writing method, mind map, outline, rough draft and editing. Do it one chapter at a time. And if you're really ambitious, um, you can go to uh, page 67 in my new book. I talk about this 30 day rough draft challenge. Uh, and, and it's kind of a, uh, it, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> for sure. It's called a yeah. challenge, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it, it can help for, for folks who say, Hey, I'm, uh, I want to dive in and make as much progress as possible over the course of 30 days and maybe even finish a draft in 30 days. Wow. Uh, I, you know what, I, I, this is a really good time to talk about the, is this the, the newest book published or is there a different book? Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me? Yeah. This is yeah. Tell one. me a little bit about that because you mentioned it a little and I sort of did a little research on Amazon, but I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about what, what it is that you're, that, that you're teaching in the book that you haven't taught yeah. before, especially. Yeah. Um, so the book is called published the proven path from blank page to 10,000 copies sold. Uh, and it's a second edition. So the first edition has been downloaded and sold hundreds of thousands of times, but kind of like we talked about at the top of this interview, we've published 6,000 books over the last few years and we've learned so much and our curriculum's gotten so much better, but the book stayed mm -hmm. the same. <laughs> and I read it back and I said, you know what, this, this kind of sucks. Um, uh, it needs to be a lot better. <laughs> and, and so I, 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 I mean, I made it way better. And so the goal is to guide people from idea or maybe even not quite sure on your idea yet to 10,000 copies mm. sold. Um, and so that's, that's the goal of the book. And that's what I try to do by walking people um, through each step in the process. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mentioned this to you before, but um, I'm happy to mention it here, but um, I created a link for folks if they want to grab a copy. Obviously, you can get it on Amazon or you can listen to the Audible version. I narrate the audio books, kind of fun. Um, but there's, uh, I created a link. It's uh, publishedbook.com. So like I published a book. So publishedbook.com forward slash is Zolda. Yep, that's it. Um, so I, I Z O L T A. That's, that's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just about to spell it out. Um, but uh, first fifty people who go to that page, I want to give you a free physical copy of the book. Um, and so this is, you know, no strings attached. You don't have to pay anything. Just tell me where to send it. I'll print it, pack it, ship it. Um, just as a thank you um, for listening to this episode. 
Uh, and as a thank you to Azolda uh, for having me come on the podcast. That is, Chandler, thank you so much. That's so, that's lovely and generous, and I appreciate it very much. And so do my listeners, I'm sure. I, I, the, the, the thing that you said about it is that, that I went, ha, huh, yeah, so true. You went back and you reread it and you went, oh, no, I can do so much better, right? <laughs> yeah, so can yeah. you talk a little bit about going back? You said earlier it's an iterative process to to write a book, but also going back and looking at your early work, you kind of go, oh, wait, I can do better now. I know more. I can yeah. write better. All of these things. Can you talk a little bit about that process? How did you how did you come to terms with it, and what did you mm. improve? Yeah, um, that's the beautiful thing about self publishing is that you can go back and make any changes, updates, or edits at any time. Right. So I didn't have to get approval from a publisher. I didn't have to get a second publishing deal. Any of those things make the process longer than it needed mm. to be. Um, I'll tell you what I did, and it's actually kind of funny. I read the book. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> um, but I marked it up. I mean, I'm talking all kinds of notes, things that I wanted to improve, all that. And you probably know this as an author yourself, but I, you know, I've got all kinds of copies of my book around the house that I just give to mm -hmm. people when they come over to the house or when I you know, go to a, a, a meeting or something. And I went to move. And, I, and, and, you know, I, I marked it up and I said, all right, I'm going to do this. And then much like a, a lot of people, our students or people before they come to work with us, <laughs> I just put it mm. off and I'm like, all right, don't have time. Don't have time. You know, all the same excuses that we hear all the time. And, and finally I was moving and I was like, all right, well, I know I still want to do this. Where's that copy that I marked up and I couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> And what I realized is that I had given it away oh, no. <laughs> uh, to some unsuspecting soul that has probably never read the book because no one ever reached out to me to tell me. Uh, but uh, and, and so I was like, oh, dang it. And I uh, so I had to go back and read it again. But it's kind of helpful because then I read it again. I marked it up and I said, all right, I need to do this. And I need to show people that this process is possible at the highest level. So while running a big company with 30 something employees and all that stuff, I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to set aside the time to do this. And I looked at all the content and curriculum. I said, what do we know now uh, that we didn't know mm. then? And what is the, our current best thinking and current best teaching? And, and then I just followed the process that I teach in the book. So I mind mapped all that stuff. I outlined all that stuff and ended up with probably it, you know, I'd estimate somewhere around 60 to 80% new content um, for the second edition and then use that and went from, you know, picking up uh, a pen on, I, I want to say it was September 1st to publishing the second edition on December 14th. So all told about 105 days, I used the process that we teach. Um, and, and I did. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and I love I love that 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 putting the punctuation point on is, is I started it and I went through the process and then I finished it. And that's finishing is hard for people. Right. That's <laughs> yeah. especially especially <laughs> for people who have a lot of things to focus on finishing, actually going, you know what, it's done yeah. is is difficult. So how do you know when it's done? Huh. You don't. <laughs> uh, it, it, you just have to decide, you know, a book is never done. You could edit a book into eternity. Uh, but at some point you just have to say, stop the badness. This is, <laughs> this is done. And I'm going to put it out. Right. <laughs> I know it's not like this precise, technical, exact uh, answer that I think a lot of people are looking for in that moment. It's just, just, but I think even some of that is you're just looking for someone to tell you that it's mm, done. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Uh, and no one's going to tell you that it's done. Um, and you're not going to definitively know. You just have to say, hey, this is, this is good enough. Right. And great news. If I'm self-publishing, I can always go back and update it later. Um, so let me publish this. Let me get feedback. Uh, and then I can go do updates later if needed. Yeah, I love that. I love the notion of of having your audience, your readers actually give you feedback. And what, what I tell my clients and, and the people I work with is put it aside and try to read it as if you weren't the one who wrote it because that's mm, really helpful yeah, you know like it's that. it's helpful because if i look at something i've written as as if i wrote it then I, all i see is the mistakes if i look at it as someone who didn't write it then i get to be more in the flow of whatever my thesis is in the flow of whatever i'm trying to say with the book and so so yeah. you know by the time it gets to an audience of course i think it's as good as i can make it like like programming right your coder doesn't give it to the qaqc person 
thinking, oh, it's full of bugs, it's full of mistakes. You think you're as done as you yeah. could be. So so let me ask you something about, about audience, right? About the people you intend mm-hmm. to read the book. Can you talk mm-hmm. to me a little bit about that, about how you choose your audience, how you how you write to your audience, or maybe you don't, maybe you write the story yeah. you wanna write and hope you find your audience, but I have a feeling you've got a process for that. And I would love it if you would talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, for sure. So I, I, I think about this, I call this the four P's of a best-selling book. Um, and I think about it this way. So I, the, the four P's, they stand for person, pain, promise, price, mm-hmm. right? Now the price part, that's pretty self-explanatory depending on what format you're using or what genre you're in. But the other three are really important. And so person, this is uh, the person that you're writing to. I'm going to come back to that. The the pain, this is the pain that they have that they know that they have. So this is, this is how they would state the pain that they have. Uh, And then uh, the promise um, is, is what's the the promise or outcome that they want or or hope to have, or that you hope to give them by them uh, reading uh, your book. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think the most important part of that is exactly what you said is your audience. And that's the person. Now, what I recommend here is coming up with one actual person in your life that you know, uh, that, that, that you write the book to, that is your, your ideal reader is what I call it. And so your ideal reader, you know, let's say it's you, Isolde. And, and so I want to come up with that one person. Okay. I know this person. Now I write the book to that person. So all the other questions that people have about writing of, okay, how do you write to, how should I write this? What should my voice be? Should I be funny? Should I be serious? Should I include this story? Should I not? All those questions get answered so easily because it's just, oh, well, how would I write this to Isolde? Mm. Would I use this story? Would I not? Would I I be serious or would I be funny? All those questions get answered and and you write to that one person. Some people will even go as as far as saying, dear Isolde, right? Like (laughs) writing it it. as if it's a letter. And, and then, uh, and then you can just delete that part after the fact. Um, but that can be, that can work really well. Um, but I, uh, that's what I recommend to write a better book and write it to a specific person. Cause then guess what, when you go market that book, you know, where that person's hanging out, which makes the marketing process easier. And there's going to be a whole lot of other people, uh, just like that person that say, oh my gosh, Chandler wrote this book directly to me. Mm. And it's going to feel like it. Cause you did, you wrote it specifically to one person. I love, 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 love that. And it's it is interesting to me that in that moment when you're when you're writing it and you're thinking, okay, I have something to say and I have something to teach. That's a different part of the process. Or maybe it's not. Maybe you have a tie into this. But but actually getting the book out there, right, the publishing it, the physical part of getting it published, getting it out into the world. But also to me, what what is one of the most challenging thing is how to launch it so that it isn't you know a drop in the bucket so that it actually works so that it actually goes where you want it to go succeeds if you will and so i'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about both and and we can break this up into several questions but first the actual physical publishing process whether it's going to be an ebook or or paperback or hardcover or whatever, but also how do you launch a book so that it actually launches instead of fizzling? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very nuanced subject and we can do multiple podcast interviews just on this piece. (laughs) You're Um, welcome back anytime. (laughs) (laughs) I'd love to. So, so uh, let me break it up in in this way. So we, we already talked about one of the fundamental pieces of marketing, which is those four P's, which a lot of people would think that that's not marketing, but at a hundred percent is because you're writing a better book to a specific audience, which writing a better book means it's more recommendable and more people are going to read it. And then to a specific audience means it's going to be easier to market. And so that's a big piece. Then you've got what I would call the fundamentals of a bestseller. Um, This is, okay, are you writing a well-written, timeless Mm. book? Uh, Are you solving a pain that people have that they know that they have that they're eagerly looking to solve? Are you, uh, do you have a good title? a good subtitle, a good cover? Do you have, if you pick keywords and categories uh, properly, like all these kind of nuanced, technical, specific stuff with Amazon, have you published all three formats of your book? 
publish three formats, you're going to sell more books, you're going to make more money on royalties, right? And have you got at least 100 reviews on Amazon? Mm. And so I know I ratted off a bunch of things there. I've got a whole checklist in, in, in the chapter in the new book on the fundamentals of the bestseller, but that's the fundamentals, right? Then there's the actual launch itself. And then there's kind of the final phase, which is what I call the one-year mm-hmm. launch. I think a lot of people look at their launch as a launch week. <laughs> and I think it's actually a launch ah, year. Uh-huh. Um, your, 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 your launch week is the starting point. Um, and you should continue to talk about it and market and market your book um, for at least a year um, after you, you publish it. Uh, and so, but so, so I think that's really important, but then I'll zoom in on, on the launch week itself. Um, and so there's what I call this is, is the launch triangle. Um, and so it's the three essentials to a successful launch. It's number one, a launch team, which I'll circle back to number two, it's getting as many reviews as possible. Mm-hmm. And then number three, uh, it's, it's promotions. Now, running promotions, there's a bunch of options and, and all that, but that's kind of the, it's like an accordion, like depending on how much time, money, and energy you have to spend on this launch, that will either be what I call the MVP launch, so the minimum viable product, right? Or it'll be the traditional launch, which is kind of everything and, and a big launch and all that stuff. And so that the promotions piece is the accordion, but I said, I'll circle back to the launch team. So launch team, this is a small group of people, 15, 50 people, maybe more who support you or the topic of the book, right? Now, what I recommend is, is, is recruit your launch team uh, and they will read the book ahead of time and leave a review on day one. So now all of a sudden you've got supporters and all of these folks leaving reviews right out of the gates um, which is going to help you have a more successful launch of the book. I'm thinking. <laughs> I just realized I'm staying quiet. I think that's I think that's a great idea. And and where where do you go to recruit these people? Are these friends? Are these people you find in Facebook groups? How do you find your launch team? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's uh, friends, family members, customers, colleagues anyone who supports you or the topic of your book. And what I like to do is share the process. Mm. So share what I'm doing as I'm doing it leading up to the launch, which just naturally people are interested in and say, oh, wow, that's amazing. I pro- you know, New York Times says 81% of people want to write a book. We know that less than 1% of people actually do it. So a lot of people in the lead up, they'll see you doing it. They're excited about that. And so when you say, hey, I'm looking for some people to join the launch team, um, they'll be interested because they've seen the behind the scenes leading up to you publishing your book. That's super cool. And so so you're talking about the leading up to and, and on day one, having a bunch of reviews and you said 100, which is, I guess that does something with the uh, Amazon algorithm that that helps your book be uh, higher up in the rankings and things. I'm wondering, though, you said launch year. What do you do? After that, what is the process that yeah. someone goes through after the big launch, after you've got a hundred, you know, a hundred Amazon reviews, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do next for that next year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you keep talking about the book and, and no, there's, there's one-off promos and then there's evergreen assets. Mm-hmm. My goal is to, is to do as many one-off promos as possible as part of the launch and leading up to the launch and after the launch, but really the goal is to create evergreen assets. So an evergreen tree, you know, has leaves that are green year round. Uh, Evergreen assets are things that you create that will continue to sell books in perpetuity, right? So an interview like this, evergreen asset that will help me sell more copies of my book published, you know, all that stuff, right? And and so this is an asset that will continue to add value to listeners that will continue to, to, to sell books, like all those things. And so I try to think about as an author, how can I spend that year creating as many of those assets as possible um, so that the book uh, continues to sell and continues to grow. I love the fact that you've codified this process so well. <laughs> this is phenomenal. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that, if you would, because Here's the thing, right? We in the in the late '90s, early aughts, we had the sort of the, the the independent music revolution, right? Things changed when people could start putting out their own MP3s, et cetera, et cetera. They weren't beholden to gatekeepers anymore. And the same thing has happened with publishing, that we're not beholden to the big six or big five now to to release a book. If you want to release a book, you can do it yourself. 
it's different. It's, you know, the, the, the book publishing revolution is different because I think the publishing houses are still holding on. There's they're still this weird gatekeeper thing. Can you talk a little bit about the push pull of that between traditional publishing and something like what you're doing with self-publishing school and what that means for an author who goes one way versus another? Definitely. I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's a self-publishing revolution. Uh, and I think uh, we, we've tried to help it. We've tried to put the power back in the hands of authors and help as many folks uh, publish as possible and, and self-publish. And now traditional publishing has its merits in some instances. If you've got a big audience uh, and, you know, you can get a big advance and all those things, then sometimes it makes sense uh, to, to traditionally publish. Um, otherwise, you're going to be, be you're going to be better off uh, self-publishing, right? And so that's what we've tried to do is 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 put the power back in the hands of authors and and help them self-publish. Um, and and you're right because you know this kind of the beautiful thing for authors is that self-publishing and you know my brother's in the music industry, so I've seen firsthand that shift as well for music. Mm-hmm. It's very similar. Um, is that it's democratized the industry. And it, it, it's much more merit based, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, I think there's a beautiful thing about entrepreneurship, but then now it's becoming the beautiful thing about authorship as well, is that the best book wins. <laughs> now, the best book that nobody knows about doesn't win. Like you still got to market that book because you could have the best book ever. And if no one knows about it, it's not going to start getting traction or grow. So marketing is very important, uh, but so is writing a great book. And there's a whole lot less gatekeepers that can keep you from writing or publishing that book. I love that. And again, mic drop. Uh, Chandler, one of the things that I would love for you to do, because I know people learn differently, if you don't mind, is how do people find you? If somebody wants to know more about self-publishing school or wants to follow you and some of the wisdom you drop, like on social media, would you mind giving me sort of, uh, you know, verbally right now, your website and your socials mm-hmm. just so that people can find you if they're looking? Yeah, of course. So um, social, I'm only on Facebook. We have self-publishing school like Instagram and all that stuff uh, that uh, people on the team who are really good at that do that. <laughs> I'm not so great at that. Um, but so uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm personally on Facebook. Um, our site is uh, self-publishingschool.com. Uh, we also own self-publishing.com. So either of those resources will lead you um, to our stuff. If you're interested in chatting with the team about your book and how we might be able to help, you can go to self-publishingschool.com forward slash apply. You can book a call with the team there. We'll chat with you, help create a plan for your book and see how we might be able to help. Uh, And then lastly, if you're, I guess, audio learner, if you're listening to this, probably check out the audio book of my new book published, um, or you can um, take me up on that, the the free book thing and and claim a free copy of the book and, 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 read the good old fashioned print version <laughs> of, uh, of the book and the book, it will really expand on a lot of what we've talked about uh, in this episode and, and help uh, more on your journeys. There's a bunch of templates and stuff like that. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And I want a copy of the book too. Uh, what, what, what I'm, what I'm most like, how do I put this? There's there are concierge services and I don't know if self-publishing school offers this. If somebody says I have an idea, I've written a book, but I don't want to do any of it. Do you offer mm-hmm. that service? Yeah, we help a lot. Okay. Um, now, important disclaimer, I'd say, so we do, uh, we'll create a best-selling book cover for you. We'll format the book. We'll upload it to Amazon. We'll do keywords and characters, like a bunch of the tough technical stuff. Uh, but there's no substitute, like those authors still need to market their books. Mm-hmm. All right. Now we're going to make marketing easier. We're going to coach you on how to do it. We're going to hold you accountable. We're going to give you frameworks to use like all those things. But I think it's one of the most important jobs that an author has. And often authors will come to us and say, okay, cool. Can I just pay you guys to market the book? <laughs> uh, and the answer is no, mm-hmm. unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and fortunately, it, 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 because it's, it, it's one of the single most uh, powerful things you can do as an author and that you need to do as an author and no one can market the book like you can. Absolutely, and as an author, no one knows your story like you know your story, whether or not it's a nonfiction book and you have pain that you're trying to alleviate, or it's a fiction book and it's a story that you're super excited to tell, no one's gonna be able to talk about it the way you can if you're the one who wrote it. So absolutely, I I agree completely. Well, Chandler, I wanna thank you so much for being on the show, for taking the time, and I also have one last question, if that's okay, before we move on to the bonus round, which is always super fun. So the question is, 
silly question, but I find that it can yield some profound answers. And I ask it of every single person who comes on the show. And the question is this. If you had an airplane, environmentally friendly, of course, that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Just get started. <laughs> I love it. Whether, whether it's your book, whether it's the, the, this goal that you have, a business that you want to start, whatever, just get started. You're never going to be ready. Just start, get feedback, and then improve. Um, yeah, that'd be it. Just get started. I love it. I love it. Chandler, thank you once again for being on the show. This is Chandler Bolt with the Self-Publishing School. I'm super grateful. And if you want to take that, that take advantage of getting a, a physical copy of the book, what's the URL again one last time? Yeah, so it's published book. So like I published a book. So published book dot com forward slash Isolda, I-Z-O-L-D-A. Awesome. And I'll put all the links to all of that stuff in the show notes. Chandler, once again, thank you. We're going to be back in just a second with that super fun little bonus episode. But until next time, this is Isolda Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. <music> Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2022. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.